calling all green-fingered gurus and plant killers alike. We got you covered every month with gardening inspiration, hands-on practical advice and fun projects to do. From the latest in plant fashion, growing your own, whether to prune or not to prune, from cover to cover, the Gardener and Detainee magazines have got your back. Get your copy now or subscribe online at thegardener.co.za. Gardening with Tanya is proudly brought to you by Gardena. Realize your gardening dreams. Effecto. Target pesky garden pests. The Gardener and Detainee magazines. And TanyaFisser.com for all your gardening goodies and supplies. Well, good morning, everybody. It's Thursday and it's time for our Facebook Live. Um, guys, for those of you that, that are tuned in right now, hello and welcome. For those that are joining us later, a belated hello to you. Um, folks, it's gorgeous. The weather is gorgeous. Um, it, it's beautiful. It's warm. That's why we're on the veranda today. Um, the dogs are chilled. Uh, well, there's not even my dog, actually. It, it kind of lives here. Long story, but I'll get back to that later. Um, and uh, it's been an eventful week. Um, we don't want to talk about negatives. We're just going to stick to the positives and what I do know. And I'm going to ask you the feeling and I'm going to ask you, do you feel it? Can you feel it? Because I can. And, and, and what is that? You can hear it whispering. You can hear it just trying. You can hear it trying to peep through it's called spring, guys. It's spring. And it, it gives me goosies. I, I get so excited for spring. I, I know she's coming. I know she's just sneaking around the corner and like saying, I'm coming. Um, folks, spring is near. Um, and with spring come a whole lot of beautiful, positive, positive energy. Um, it comes with a renewal, a renewal of life. Um, of attitudes, of perceptions, of all those good things. And I hope that I can give a little bit of that to you. Um, it's, it really is a wonderful time for all of us to just embrace that thing, that thing. And, and I know that gardening just brings it to us. The amazing thing about spring is that whether you even are not a gardener, whether you are talking to your mate who like kills plants or like, his garden is just concrete, um, you know, blafacels. Is that right? Pavers, blafacels. What's a pay? What's a blafacel? Huh? Yeah, yeah blafacel. Kijk die groot woord so vroeg in die ochend. Um, that that the garden is there isn't a garden. Even those people, their cars end up in the parking lot at a garden centre. And they don't know how they got there. <laughs> and I love it because that is what spring does to all of us. Um, so, folks, let's herald her in. Let's give her a really big welcome. And, uh, and let's get our energy. Let's get our minds in the right place. It's all been tough. Every single one of us has had a tough year. Um, it, it, I know. Everybody's got something. Everybody's got something. There's a monkey on their shoulder and sometimes there's like a whole troop okay we're gonna shake them off shake them off go away move along and we're gonna find the good stuff okay guys let's see who's saying good morning um, I see a lot of you were already online before we went live so let's say good morning to all of you guys um, Rose good morning yes spring has sprung there we are Al Marie um, from Senegal. Um, but is there still time for us in the Free State? 
but it's still a time. Oh, no, 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 no. You, you listen, okay, don't, you are going to have a little bit, you still got a bit of winter left there, um, but don't worry about that. Uh, Kirsten, good morning. Um, oh, African violets. Ooh, okay, we're going to get to that. Um, good morning, Ricks. Good morning, Alida. Uh, Justin, yes, Alida, you got it right. Um, Justin from Paternoster. Hey, is that Justin who collects echeverias? If that's Justin from Paternosta who collects Echo... Oh, no, I love Paternosta. Um, it is Justin! Justin! Batman! How are your Echeverias? And I know you got to see some of my... What's that grey thing that I got? I can't even remember now. I'm so excited. Oh, but man, listen. That boy, he knows how to grow Echeverias. And he has got such an amazing collection. Plants like this big. Like it made me buckle at my knees. I went into sheer depression after that. Complete depression. Um, uh, who else is here? What is that? What is that guy called? Oh, Justin, give me the name, please. Write it down. That beautiful grey one. Anyway. Uh, Leona, good morning. Maureen, hello. Um, Ruan Pele, good morning to you guys. Uh, Bonnie, Jean, Nadia, Nicole. Um, uh, who else have we got here? Siba Sisa, good morning. Um, Paige Kula um, from Port Chepston, good morning to Tanya and crew. So we're we even getting good mornings, Mason. There we go. Good mornings to you behind the camera there. Um, Bianca from Camperdown, rural Cato Ridge. Ah, is that like Upper Upper Highway or Upper Upper Fresno? I don't know what you guys are talking about, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Renata loves my top. Oh, thank you very, very much. I decided, seeing as we're going indoor, we're going quite delicious, okay? Uh, quite floriferous is the word. Um, who else is here? Who else is here? Uh, Kathy, good morning. Kathy, good morning from Coxstad. Bernice from Port Chepston. Thelma, good morning. Um, Jenny, Anne, um, Joan, and uh, Nicole, Michelle Mayer. Um, guys, Brilliant to have you all joining us this morning. So, we're talking indoor plants and we're talking unhappy ones. Okay, so we've all got unhappy plants. And it doesn't matter how good you are, guys. You're going to find that. Um, uh, I've got one. I don't know if I should actually show you. Okay, but it's not mine. And, and I'm going to throw someone under the bus for this. And she knows exactly who she is. Um, but let me get this plant. Oh, I shame. Sistoch. I the Aramadung. So, so the first question, <laughs> you know, sometimes plants are so beyond, they are so dead, you've actually got to work out what it was. Um, guys, this was a bird's nest fern. Um, many of you have, have killed plants um, and sent them earlier to heaven. Um, I get that. We, we do things wrong. Um, and uh, this was my child's plant. Um, I don't quite know what she did to it. Uh, what did you do to this, Mix? She, she forgot about it. Right. Right. Okay. And overwatered it. Right. Okay. But she's learning fast. She's learning really, really fast. And I'm actually very proud to say that she's become a very, very good gardener or becoming a good gardener. So, yes. Hi, Shane. We need to have a memorial service for this thing uh, because it died very, very slow. Okay, guys, so um, let's have a look at what's going on here. And let's talk about why plants end up like this. So the couple of things and the most things that we get wrong when we're looking at indoor plants is the following. It's light. Light, light, light. Where does this plant, where is it going to do best? Is it going to do best here? Is it going to do better there? The problem is, with most indoor plants is that we buy it to suit, hold on, you know where this is coming, we buy it to suit the interior. I need something with sparks in this back corner. I need something with rounded leaves because it's going to help the feng shui. Near yella, near. And then you take that poor plant and, and you take it and you put it at the end of the passage where it's dark as the depths of hell. And you wonder why the thing dies. Guys, plants, especially indoor plants, are grown for us to look in the optimal condition when we purchase them. Yeah, they are like supercharged. They look amazing. They, they really, really do. 
So don't be so hard on yourself as well if they do lose a bit of condition. Because guys, these have been grown in like, like basically incubators for little babies that are prim. Um, they've been looked after perfectly, um, not, a, not a speck, not a spot on the leaves. And then we bring them along and say, right, you're on your own, buddy. Show me what you can do. Well, <laughs> you know, that's like taking that little prem baby and putting it on Addington Beach, um, which is in Durban, um, in the full summer sun, or even worse, uh, at the end of a very dark, dingy, cold corridor, and saying, you're on your own. It doesn't work like that. Okay, so, light. We're going back to light. Guys, what's very, very important is that you ask the right questions. Does this plant need bright light or does it need low light? So they are bright light plants and they are low light plants. And we're going to touch on those very, very quickly. But ideally, what you're looking for, ideally, is a position in your home where these plants will get natural filtered light. Okay, natural filtered light. So that's not that hot baking afternoon sun. You know those sun rays. When I sit at my desk in the afternoons, I've got to draw the curtains because chalk, that sun comes in, sheen, like a, almost like a Flash Gordon kind of, one of those things. And it comes in sharp and hard. That light is quite damaging, okay? That light is quite damaging, especially if you're going to have three or four hours of it. it it's going to hurt your plant. If you've got an indoor plant that's been grown in these beautiful conditions and you put it in a position where it's going to get whew, full morning sun, it's going to fry. Okay. So how do we know if it's getting too much light? Your first signs are going to be, and this was, you can see the damage that's happened here. So if you just come in here, Mace, and give them a close up here, look at this. You can actually see that it's burned. This leaf here has gone it, it would have started off yellow, but now it's almost gone a brown, like you've taken a flame to it, okay? And, and that is that browning because all the chlorophyll is dead. So the chlorophyll is dead, this leaf is browned. So that can be from too much direct light, okay? And that you find by the splotches. You can see it here, okay? When the plant starts going through that, it starts getting stressed. Why? Because it's getting too much sun, it's getting burnt, it's getting heat. It's, its cells are getting too much heat and they're basically boiling up, if that would be the right way to put it. The next thing that starts happening is the plant starts losing condition. Just like us, when we get stressed out, we, our immune system drops. When we're stressed out about this, that, that, whatever, the Marmite finished, um, you know, we all start getting stressed out. When that happens, our immune systems drop, okay? When that happens, oh, if there's a little flu bug or a little rona running around, guess who it's gonna get? Boom, it's gonna hit you and it's gonna take you out. And we know that. Like if you're in a room and the person over there's got the sniffles, you're just gonna like, okay, okay, stay away. Move away from the subject because you know that you'll probably get it. Exactly the same. And look at this plant here is a pure sign Look at it there. What do we have here? Now this is scale, guys. Look at it here. There it is. Scale is, looks like a very, very little tortoise. Looks like a little, little tortoise because um, it's curved like that. And uh, you get brown scale, you get black scale. Um, and that basically, oh, it's very, very small. You can actually pull it off with your, with your finger. Um, but scale is a, is a little medium to soft bodied insect that basically embeds itself on the leaf and sucks all the nutrients out of it. It's like an alien horror movie. You know, when they go and they stick their I mean, that's what it's doing. So when the plants get stressed out, that's when they get diseases and that's when they get insect attacks. Okay, then if your plant is nearly dead like this or actually most dead, hold on, I'm just gonna, no, it's dead. There's no signs of life here. No, nothing's going to work. Mouth to mouth resuscitation. It's beyond coma. Sometimes you've got to call it a day. True story. If you had to go now 
And if we had to prune away all these leaves and try and talk to it and try and resuscitate it. My friends, by the time you have spent money on the plant food, on the insecticide, on the whatever it is to try and fix it, you could have bought four of these. Four. So sometimes we got to let it go and we got to say, compost heap. Okay. If it's got disease like this, you don't put it on the compost heap. You put it in a packet. Um, you throw it on the bra and burn it. Or you put it in a packet and you send it away with your refuse people. Um, because this thing is beyond its sell-by date. Hey, no claw. Okay. So I'm putting him down here. All right. Okay. Yeah, he's gone. He's gone. Psst. Okay. So light is the one thing we've touched on. Please always ask the right questions. Um, the next thing that we need to talk about is watering. And watering is probably the foremost reason why we kill the plants. Um, it's too much. It's too little. We've drowned it. Or it's been stuck in the karoo. Because it got no water. Um, so this morning, just preparing for this live, I was walking around here and having a look. And, and I picked up this pot. I thought, jeez, you're a bit heavy, and I'm going to show you that we all get it wrong. And I don't quite know who the last person was to water this plant, but when I'm finished today, I'm going to hunt that person down, and it's not going to be pretty, because look at what I found. Look here. This is a beautiful um, spathophyllum. It's also known as a peace lily. Um, this can cope with low light, low light and medium light. So a bit of early morning sun will be fine for it. In a bathroom, 100%. In your lounge, perfect. Wherever there's a little bit of natural light coming through. But as I said, can also cope with dark light. When you're dark light, that doesn't even make sense. Where there's no light. Um, the less light you have, the darker green the leaves will go. Okay. But look what's happened here. Exhibit A. Hold on, hold on. Oh, look in there. Oh, caramba. Why are you looking sad? Why are you nearly dead? Well, you're dead because this is the fatal mistake that is made. The most, the biggest mistake that's made with indoor plants. We water them in their pot cover. Now, I had a thing here. Yes, right, here it is. So... So guys, this is called a pot cover, okay? This thing here. We all get them, they all look pretty. Um, uh, we swap them out as, as, as often as we swap out our cushions um, and depending on our style and if we're into greys or purples, shame, um, or whatever color you're into, uh, we, we generally then change our pot cover. But the mistake that we make is we water the plant in the pot cover. Now, I've spoken to you about this time and time again, guys. Please do not water the plant in the pot cover because this is the result. Um, the plants then sit in this water. Now, when we put this in here, the water is almost three quarters the way, which means that this plant is going to remain saturated for at least two weeks. Now, if I had to put your feet into, you know, one of those spa baths, you know when you go and have your nails done, your toenails, whatever, and you put your feet in one of those little things. I know they were very popular in the 80s. I think every mother was getting one as a gift, and they'd borrow up, and then you'd do this, how's your fathering to them, and, and whatever, whatever, and buff them. Yeah, I asked for matte, matte plain nail varnish. <laughs> I don't think you get that. <laughs> but anyway, if you had to put your feet in one of those spa baths for two weeks, and if you took them out after two weeks, what would the result be? Yeah, you're right. Fraught. Fraught and stunk. They would be rotten. Okay? Because your feet are not meant to be in water for two weeks. Neither are a plant's roots unless it's a swamp cypress or unless it's a philodendron like this. This little philodendron called Berkia loves wet feet. Loves it. Because look. It's actually growing in water. Okay, so dependent on the plant, but the general rule is to be safe if you're not too sure on it. 
rather water like this. Okay, so you're going to take your plants, and that's why we say pop them into the bath, put them in the shower. Put them in the shower. You know, put the shower in cold, step aside after you've had your little stort, okay, step aside, and then water them. Because then you get to clean the leaves. If not, then I want you to do this when you are watering, folks. Um, and if you just get a, a big guy like this, um, which is a, um, an ice cream dish or whatever, Tupperware. And in here, you can mix your plant foods, whatever your plant foods are. We love using multi-grow. So we'll use multi-grow and then we'll alternate, we'll alternate with some of this lovely Kelpak. So the Kelpak is the seaweed extract, okay? So it's like a good tonic. It's like taking your zinc. You know what I mean? Yeah. So this is a good tonic, and then we'll use this, the multigrow, which is full of all the NPKs. It's got the potassium and it's got calcium in it. It's got all those good things. So you mix that into your, yeah, into your watering can. It's really easy. Cap full into five liters of water. Give it a stir, and I'm looking for something to stir it with. And I can't find anything, so I'll use my hand, and we give it a good stir. Okay, and then we're going to give it a watering. So, that's how we water it. We water, and I know this guy's already quite drenched, but we water until the water pours out through the bottom. Pours out through the bottom. Then you can leave it in there for at least half an hour to an hour. Leave it there. Because what happens now is that the, the water has gone through, the little soil particles of the bark have now absorbed some moisture, and what they need more, they then suck up from the bottom. Okay, But bottom watering is not for every day. Do not leave your plants sitting in water like this, please, unless they are of the philodendron family or the irum lily family. Do not. They will die. Okay, They will frot. Okay, so that, and, and I know there's a, a, a big thing going on about bottom watering now, and you can leave them in there, and, and, but guys, it, if it was tried and tested, it would have been done for the last 30, 40 years, and, and it hasn't been, and it hasn't been, and that's not even how growers grow plants. Um, so please take caution with that. The good thing about this is watch what we can do. So we've watered this guy. Let's not waste this, because this has got all the good plant food in it. We take that and we pop it back in there. Okay, right. And then we can put the next plant up. Put that in there and we can water and we can just recycle that water. So that's the way that you can do it. We like leaving them in the bath. We literally put the plug in, put them in the bath, add some of our plant food to it, take a jug, water them, water them, water them, leave them there for about half an hour to an hour and then take them out once we are done. And I'm going to get rid of all this haha water here. And there we go. When you leave it for a while, it actually starts smelling. And that's because the plant roots and the good bacteria and the good fungus that are living in your soil die as well. Because they are not amphibians. This is not aquatic gardening. Okay? So we do that. We put our little baby back and we put him up here. And. He's good to go for another seven to ten days because that is how often you should be watering your plants every seven to ten days and how do we know that because some plants yes like ferns need more they need more little sips but the best way like always is just to literally do um, a physical test and I'll show you here when we're doing a physical test take the plant out and what we do is pop our finger there onto the soil, pull it out. Yes, there's soil attached. This plant is still good to go for another few days. If I put my finger on here, let's find another plant. Oh, here we go. Here's a perfect example. If I took my finger and I put it there and I took it out, no soil. Right, this guy, she's thirsty. Okay, and remember, when you're watering, to water all around the soil, water all the round, not only through one section, and then it only pours throughout the one. Try and get it to go all the way around. Okay, very, very, it's the little things, guys. It's the little things that will make us much better at what we do. All righty, um, whilst we're talking about indoor, I want to talk about diseases. Oh, I've got, oh, I've been told I've got questions, questions. 
Um, so let me go uh, to the queue. Let's go and have a look here. Ah, Justin. Ah, here <laughs> to you too and Durban. Oh, oh, the big grey echeveria is called ranioli. My question is, do variegated indoor plants have any spe special requirements over their normal versions? <gasps> you just got a variegated monstera and she needs VIP treatment as I can't afford to lose her. You are so right. Where's that monstera? Oh, caramba. Okay, Mace, I'm going to pick this up. I'm going to bring this back to my station. Okay, guys, this plant, this plant is like gold. It needs a big insurance policy. Okay, this is the variegated Monstera. She's a beaut. Um, we bought her as a little cutting about this big for a few hundred rons. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, it's just a cough I've got. Um, so you want to look after this baby. Justin, it's a good question about variegation. Remember, where there's variegation, there's no chlorophyll. Okay, where there's variegation, there's no chlorophyll which means that this plant would need slightly more light than normal. Don't take a variegated plant and put it in low light. It's not going to like that. Okay, except your one, there's, there's, always, there's always an exception to the rule. Because the one low plant that you could put in low light that will stay alive and you will not kill it and you can even swear it blind and be really ugly to it is of course the mother-in-law's tongue. Exhibit B. Um, this has got some lovely variegation in it, uh, but this plant you can have in low, low light and it will still keep that. What is going to happen is that that band of the variegation is simply going to get narrower and narrower because the plant is going to need more green in order to cope and photosynthesize. So uh, what is important is that variegation needs slightly higher light, but Justin, good luck with your darling. Um, Nothing else that you need to worry about. Take care of it as normal. And remember, indoor plants don't like being moved. And if you're one of those people that love de uh, redecorating the house and move things all over, just leave the pot plants where they are, especially if they're happy. Um, indoor plants do not like air conditioners. They don't like breezes. So if, you, if we open our front door and we open the back door of the house, there's a gale that comes through. Literally, gale steps into the building. And if we've got a plant in between, we've tried to grow a fern in this one place. And listen to me. Do, do you hear what I've just said? We've tried to grow a fern in this one spot. And, and we fail every time. But you know, I'm being doff. I'm being stupid. It's because of the wind. It's because of the breeze. She don't like it. Ferns are used to being in forests where it's calm and gentle. And the birds are tweeting. Not... <laughs> Get it. Okay, so it's about it's about finding the right conditions. So they don't like breezes, they don't like heat, they don't like very, very cold temperatures, and don't move them around. If they're happy in a spot, loss it. So it's your mark for your cassette. Okay, so let's put this darling back over here. Um, but uh, yeah, right, we had a question. Um, I think there was a question on African violets. Oh, right, African violets. Now, Sure, you know, they came and went through, through phases um, of, uh, of popularity. Very, very interesting. I mean, it was probably like the yucca. I remember that terror, the, remember those plants, yuccas? Yucky, yuck, yucca, yuck. Anyway, oh, I, I don't even like saying the word, yeah, yucca. So yuccas were in fashion. They're those sparky things and they were really, I mean, why on earth would you want to put that plant in your house if you've got like a two or three year old running around? It's going to impale itself in one of the, the thorns. But anyway, they were very, very popular. And for those of you unfortunate enough to have planted the yucca outside, um, it's now escaped and it's become a tree that's four, five, six meters tall. And for those of you who also had a rubber plant back in the 70s and decided that you'd free willy and plant it into the garden, you've probably got a 30 meter tree now that you're going to have to pay about 17,000 rand to have the tree feller remove it. So some plants are best kept in their containers. But beautiful African violets, shame, have um, been at the throes of popularity in and out, in and out. And there still are a few amazing collectors around the country uh, because they are beautiful. They're nostalgic. 
um, and I'm sure many, many homes, uh, and I see it. I mean, I, I've got it in my head. My mom had this, an African violet, still in its brown little pot, plastic pot, sitting in the kitchen windowsill on a mismatched saucer. Yeah, yes, yes, and a little bit of water and the rings of where the water used to sit, the brown rings were still there in that saucer. And when you tried to clean that saucer, you actually couldn't get it clean unless you jicked it. Um, okay, so African violets, folks, here are a couple of rules. Okay. Um, when you water them, water with tepid water. Okay, tepid water. Because African violets live naturally. This is where they're from. And I think I've got the right mountain. It's the base of Kilimanjaro. That's where they come from, the base of Kilimanjaro, where it is warm, warm, hot, tropical, okay? If you give them tepid water, not hot, tepid water, they will flower more constantly. They need food because from where they originate, as the water that filtrates through them, as that water filtrates, it's full of nutrition, full of good nutrients. So make sure that you are feeding them. Please feed them, feed them. Never water the leaves. You only water the soil because they, the leaves are full of little hairs and sometimes the water can get stuck on there and then it starts rotting. Don't do that. They like a very rich soil. That makes sense. Think about from whence it came. Yes, because they're at the base of a mountain where there's good, beautiful soil that's been eroded from those from the, um, the the rocks that have got full of minerals so when you're doing an african violet mix and some garden centers actually sell an african violet mix you will always find in it a bit of perlite you will always find a bit of palm peat you will always find a bit of um, vermiculite in it mixed with your potting soil but it's got the aeration as well okay so um when you find a bad leaf that's starting to go off Please, what you do is you don't just break it off here. No, you don't do that. You've got to follow this little guy. Where are you now? You've got to follow it all the way down, all the way down to where it joins the plant. Pop your finger in there. Ah, there it is. And there, it's away. That's the whole thing. That's what you want to remove. Okay, nice and easy. So, okay, that's the African violet. Now, things that can go wrong. So we've spoken about light, we've spoken about what they don't like, we've spoken about watering. Now, when it comes to jojos, mm, jojos, jojos, I'm going to show you exhibit B. Oh dear, oh dear, oh, caramba. Okay, these are the most common problems that you can find in your indoor plants, guys. And uh, here is one, Mace, I don't know if you can get in close there, but uh, look at that. Um, oh, I've got such winter fingers. My goodness, look at this from all the gardening. Can you see? Oh, gosh. I need, I need a manicure, dear. Um, uh, anyway, um, this is mealybug. It, people often write to me and they say, I've got this fluffy white stuff on my plant. Fluffy, it looks like cotton wool. Yeah, that is mealybug. Guys, mealybug is horrid. Um, it starts off as small little specks. Small, small little specks. In fact, here is the start of some mealybug. Oh, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but um, people will often say, I get laser. I get laser off my plant. But that lice is actually the beginning of mealybug. Um, and they're very, very small, and you can literally just wipe them off with your hand like that. But the problem is, there, do you see when I've wiped it off? Look at it all there. Look at it all there. Ugh. Okay, so mealybug is quite hard to get rid of. Um, you generally find it when plants are stressed once again or pot bound because I guarantee you if I have to do this to this poor plant oh yeah oh, oh oh well there we go I told you instinct will tell you the plant is telling you something's wrong I'm not feeling very well okay and it's telling you even although you're watering me mom even although you're watering me once a week I'm still dry on the inside, okay? I'm still not getting enough nutrition because there's too much soil around it. And I guarantee you, I'm going to do this. And do you know what? I might be wrong. But before I make a terrible mess on my counter, I'm quickly going to put out my, my little gardener mat. And listen, I've got to tell you, 
My child steals this from me every week. I keep it in the garage. I go back and I go and look for it because I need to pot up something. Yeah, he's back. The contento. Um, anyway, um, our little gardena planting mat is an absolute whiz. So pop it out wherever you're going to be working, uh, guys, because then you don't make a mess anywhere else. And before I destroy this poor little African violet, I'm actually just going to move it. Right. Okay. So let's just do this. And I just want to do this over here. All right. Before I break something else. Okay, guys. Right. So I want to show you the typical signs here. If I break into this. Okay, and I'm going to open it up. Here we go. Here we go. Inside, it's dry. Inside, it's dry. The soil, the water, when you've been watering it, has just been stuck here on the outside. It hasn't gone to the core of the plant, which means, yes, buddy, you've got to repot this thing. Because if you don't repot it, it's not getting enough moisture. The moisture is not getting to the, the core of the plant, which means it's going to get stressed out, which means we're going to get mealybug, lace, and we are going to get one of the hardest things to get rid of is this. Come and have a close look here. There's the scale. You can see them, like little, little brown dots all over it. Horrid, horrid, horrid. And this thing, this thing reproduces like nobody's business. Um, and, and it'll soon engulf and colonize the whole plant. So how do we get rid of it? Guys, we use this um, at home. It's called Garden Gun. It's already mixed. Okay, so I don't need to worry about putting two mils of this into 10 liters of water. And I'm like, hold on, hold on. Mathematics, because my container's only 750 milliliters. <laughs> I, I, know, I know it happens to you. Come on. You get this, you open it up and it's like 50 mils and 5 liters of water. Right. Worst of all, some of you don't even own one of these beautiful Gardena little spray house your father's and you're using a window lean bottle. Scarm yo. <laughs> I know you do. And the window lean bottle, by the way, FYI, is 750 mils, just if you wanted to know. And now how, how hard does the math get? because it's 50 mils into 5 litres, so 25 mils into, into 25 litres. No, into 2.5 litres. And then from there you go 12.5 into 3.5 litres. By the time you get down to 1 litre, it's like 0.35 mils. But, but then you saw over it that you just take the mooty and you say, Kom ons gooi om loop top, skat. Kom, papa. And what you do is, is you just take this measuring thing and you pour some in and you say, I think this will kill it. And you put it in. What's going to happen? You're using too much of the poison and you're going to probably kill the plant as well. Okay, so that's why we like the garden gun. Um, certainly for little indoor plants because you don't want to have to go and mix up a whole big container. Um, you just give it a shake. It's a pyrethroid. Guys, it's, it's pretty safe to use. Pyrethrums are one of the the most gentler to use. It's kind of like organic, then you get pyrethrums. You can also use oleum, um, which you can pick up at your local garden center. But garden gun will kill ants, even out, uh, ants in the garden, if you so wish. Um, it'll get rid of scale, mealybug, aphids, um, little caterpillars, those little guys. Um, and all you do is you just give it a spray because this is a, this is a, a um, basically a product that you spray on, it gets absorbed into the insect through its mouth parts, and then it dies. Right, so um, that's the way it works. You apply it once a week. And remember when you are spraying these, guys, you use your practical brain. Don't spray it inside the closed room and close the door near. Take it out onto the patio, give it a spray, leave it there, and then take it back inside. Okay, just use your practical brain. Okay, so we're going to put this baby over here. You want to spray once a week um, until there are no signs of the disease. Okay, I've been told to have a look. Um, uh, bah, bah, bah. Uh, Renu, is that how I say it? Renu Dinesh. Um, I will learn a few South African words. Where are you from? Please advise how you can make, 
how can I have my peace lily to flower? Ooh, okay. Renew, here's the here's the, 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 the trick. The trick is when we buy peace lilies, of course they're in flower. Of course they're in flower. That's why would we buy it? Okay, they're in flower because that's the growers know, the clever people know that we will then buy eight times more peace lilies than one that isn't in flower. So it's been forced to flower. Okay. Yeah, it has. Bottom line. How do you think we get poinsettias, those beautiful red Christmas things, to be in full flower during Christmas time when they actually flower in winter? They force to flower. So as soon as they come into our homes and they get put into a normal general life cycle, um, they they clutch out, basically, because they're not getting the right nutrition. They're not getting enough of that nutrition constantly. So remember, we spoke about feeding. Okay, so whether you're going to do one week with Calpac, one week with your multi-grow, feed, 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 and move the plant to higher light. Okay, peace lilies will flower if you're getting good light. So that's critical for them. Although, as I said, they can cope in low light. You're going to get lots of leaves, but very little flower. So move that plant into slightly higher light. Um, and they are quite thirsty plants. Not drowning like that one was over there. Okay, no, not like that. Very bad example. But they do enjoy more water. So keep up the watering. Maybe you've got to water twice a week. Just do the finger test and you'll know. Right. Okay. So jojos we've dealt with. Um, guys, what I want to go into. Ah, this is what I want to touch on. I want to touch on succulents and indoors, okay? Because, yeah, it's all the rage. Put a succulent in a glass bowl, put it inside, watch it die slowly. <laughs> Most succulents are big, fleshy, fat plants that come from the deserts of Arizona, from that central band um, in the Americas, uh, or slightly lower, that's where they generally come from. We take a poor little Echeveria or plain fit blanky and we put it in a little bowl and we put a few clippies inside there and we put it on our dining room table and hey, like, like buy a moi. But she just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller because there's not enough light. If you are going to grow succulents indoors, and I'm not saying that you can't, this guy over here has been growing at our kitchen, on, on the, the, the kitchen counter, right by the window for over a year. And it's happy as Larry. This is a Hawarthia, because some Hawarthias can cope with low light. Okay, this is an indigenous plant, Hawarthias. Um, this is one of the zebra varieties. Look at its little, look at its little strepies. It is too cute. And you also get the other Hawarthia varieties, which are plump and they like they're like little marshmallows. They're like short and squat and just gorgeous and just just beautiful. They're like a beautiful curved lady. Um, and those you'll see they're really, really plump. Um, and those can grow in almost no light. So the Hawarthias are perfect to have indoors. Okay. But this one. This variety of Hawarthia needs more light, whereas the plain green one, remember, can do with less light. I'm going to show you a typical example of what happens when a succulent doesn't get enough light. This is a crassula. Crassulas, and take a look here. I'm going to show you. If I remove this here, so can you see that growth at the bottom there? Dark, almost chocolate, got its colors because it needs light. Crashulas need lots of light. This little guy, because of where I've had it during the winter and the sun has moved, it hasn't got enough light. It hasn't got what it needs. But if I remove this, there's, that's what it should be looking like. Not like this. What, and when we, why do we know? Do you see in between here? The internodes. In between the leaves, so there's a leaf, there's the leaf below it. That section of stem is called an internode. When the internodes stretch, do you see how it's stretched there? When the internode is stretched, it means he's looking for light. Jack and the beanstalk. Aksuk, aksuk. Okay? And that is a sign 
of not enough light. Okay. And that's what you'll find with your psyche. Look, it's even, it's even like starting to fall over because there's, they've stretched so long, the cell walls have stretched so long that they've lost strength. Okay. So that's a for Whatever you do, do not take this plant now and say, right, buddy, you got to toughen up. I'm going to put you out into the full sun. No. Remember, that's the baby in the incubator taken to Addington Beach. It's got to be a gentle, slow process. So take it from low light, a couple of weeks in medium light, a couple of weeks in high light, back out to where it should be. Okay. Never, ever, 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 if it's raining, ever, ever, take your plants out for a bit of a bath. And look, they're getting some lovely rain and they're going to feel so much better because what happens? You forget and you forget them out there and the next day they get a bit of sun and a bit of too much sun and they didn't have SPS 50 and they got burnt. Never ever take them outside to get a little bit of light. Okay? Don't. All right, guys. Um, we spoke about a plant that needed repotting. So let's show you how to do it. Let's show you how to get it right because I know a lot of you are going to want to do that with some of your indoor plants because, yes, a lot of you are growing great plants and they are thriving. And when they get too much and they get stuck and they're not getting that enough nutrition, well, we've got to pot them on. So um, I'm going to be using this beautiful Sansevieria. Now, folks, I want to see what's underneath here. Oh, here we go. It's my grubber. Okay. Now, folks, when you are, are repotting, remember, save yourself the time, trouble, effort, and getting into trouble. Put down the Gardena mat because it does a great job. Um, I'm using a beautiful mother-in-law's tongue. And these plants, at one point in our life, you could literally you could pick them up for a couple of rand. Well, they're now so popular. And they've become an in-plant because they're good for feng shui. They've got beautiful movement in them. They're really tough. You can't kill them. So um, you're now paying a lot of money for them. I wonder what we paid for this. Oh, 175 South African rent. That's what we paid for this guy. So lo and behold, I want to make sure that it stays alive. And even better, I want to get more babies out of it. So what we're going to do is this. I'm first going to get my soil mix right. Now, folks, um, I want you to do this. Um, we've got some potting soil here. Um, it's a good premium potting soil, uh, bark-based, and that's that's potting soil. You're not taking from the plant that died 100 years ago and saving that bit of soil to bulk it up. This is going to be my main container, and I'm going to mix and add everything to that. It's a really simple process, guys, and I want you to follow it like this. Perlite. We are going to add perlite to it. Perlite is, listen to it. Can they hear that? You hear it? It's like, Ooh, it makes my teeth go funny. Uh, perlite is, a, is, is almost, it feels like polystyrene, but it's not. It's actually a type of stone. It's a pumice. It's incredibly lightweight, and it's really good for aeration, for drainage. So into a half, a, a, a trug, this is probably about eight liters. I'll probably put in probably about mm, 500 mils, probably like two, two cupfuls. Let's work it like that. So, so let's say this was, was eight liters or even five liters, guys. So a bucket, a five liter bucket. You would add in two cupfuls of perlite, okay? Right, that's for drainage. What I am going to add in is a handful or two, because you can't add, you can't overdo this, um, of some Atlantic Bio Ocean. Um, this is pelletized chicken litter. When mixed into the soil, you don't get that beautiful earthy chicken smell. Um, and what I am going to add in as well is some vermiculite. Vermiculite is also a volcanic product, folks. It has the ability to hold moisture. Um, it's wonderful in indoor plants. And what I'll do is I'll add about the same amount of perlite. So that's four handfuls or two cups. All right, so that goes in there. All right, what I'm going to do next um, is give it a good mix. Um, and I'm using my little trowel here. Um, and this just is so easy. Okay, give it all a good mix because this is going to form the basis of your mix. But I've got one more thing to add because you know that when you start taking apart your plants that you've bought, you've seen it in there. You know they use it in there. And of course, it's what we have used 
for many, many years. And you see it lives in this Tupperware is, of course, our palm peat. So we take our palm peat. Um, this is one block that's been put in here. We add water to it. It swells up like that and makes five liters. And I'm going to probably put in one, two, three handfuls. Palm peat. Look, it's still got moisture in it at the bottom here. Palm peat holds moisture. So between the moisture that we've got here, the airiness, the fluffiness, we've got the, the perlite, which is going to help to keep the little, the, the little pockets of oxygen in the soil, which we need. We've got the vermiculite to hold the water. Man, we've got a good recipe here. Plus, we put in the organic pellets. Okay, so let's get rid of that. All right, and now, final mix. Okay, here we go, guys. All right. Now, keep this. Do you know, don't, don't mix it and then throw it away or whatever. Just keep this mix. Because then, whenever you have the urge to repot, you don't have to go and make a whole new mix again and make it a big story. Um... Right, so let's put that one side. Now, let's open you up. Remember, when you're taking out a pot, a squeeze and a squeeze and out it comes. Ha, look at that. Oh, you beauty, you beauty. Now, sometimes we have to get a little bit more active with this, hey? and put in a little bit more muscle power and you might need a second tier just to cut through them. If you've got the plant, like that one that we showed you, this one here, okay, if you've got one like this, with really thick root system, guys, grab your little grubber, okay, grab your grubber like this, and I'm going to do it towards you there, and all I want you to do is open up the roots like that, do you see that, you're opening up the roots, giving it some space, some air, all right, and then you will repot. And this plant will be so much happier. Because what happens, they almost get brainwashed into going around in circles. And they're all... And then what happens when it goes too fast? They fall off. Poof, just like a child flung off a merry-go-round. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So uh, remember, use your little grubber and scrape like that just to loosen the roots and, and give it a bit of space. Now, I've got a lovely terracotta pot. Um, because I'm um, on a time constraint, I'm going to plant one up for you and I'm going to show you how to do it very, very quickly. We're planting it straight into this pot with no pot cover. Remember, with the terracotta, you're going to treat it the same way when you want to water it. You're going to take it, put it in the bath, water it, okay? Drip, 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 put it back. Make sure it's dried at the bottom, okay? Now, there are two ways of doing this. One, you can add some gravel to the base, okay? Just cheapest gravel you can get um, pop that in the base and what that's going to do is that is going to help to stop the soil from falling out all right like a Hansel and Gretel trail the other way that you can do it is to take a little piece of shade cloth um, just cut it like that and pop the shade cloth on the bottom all right and that's just going to stop the soil from pulling through it's really easy from here guys We've got our mixture. Um, we're going to pop a little bit in. Oh, and it looks good. It looks so good. Pop our plant in there. Now, if you've got excess roots like this, do you see these long ear roots here? Don't be scared. Do that. Do that. Okay. Don't be scared. Just give it a light pruning. At the, that is, because I know what happens. You've got these long roots and you start folding them and trying to force them into the pot. And you're like... <laughs> You will get in there, and then you push that root in, and then the root comes, it sticks out. It's like a gray hair. If you ever try to get rid of a gray hair, it comes, okay, so rather just, instead of forcing it and breaking it and mushing it, probably causing an area of perfect disease, um, just cut it off. Okay, so we get our little plant in. Okay, yeah, I like that. Now, have a look here. What we're finding, very, very simply, is that here is a new shoot. This is going to grow and form more leaves because that's how they grow. They grow from the shoot base out. Now, I don't have a pair of secateurs on me right now, so I'm going to do this because these are incredibly tough because this is my main plant. This is what I want. I'm just going to chop that off there. And if I plant this, let this callus a bit, plant that, it will grow. It will grow. Brilliant. Okay, so I take that little guy, pop him in there, hold it, 
hold it, don't do that. Hold it. So it's not actually on the base of the soil there. Okay, I've lifted it just slightly up. And then as you're holding it, you then fill in the soil around. Okay, because now what's happening is the soil is filling in between the roots. Give it a bit of a shake. There we go. <gasps> now we see what's happening. Take the back end of your trowel and just pop it in like that. We're not burying it too deep. We're not throttling it up to its throat. We're firming it down. Firm, firm, firm. Never fill the pot all the way to the top because then when you water it, the water goes all over and it causes a terrible mess. Um, I can put in a little bit more soil here. Five minutes. <laughs> okay, give it a bit of a knock. One, two, three. It settles the soil. And there's my baby. Good to go. Doesn't that look smart? What do I use when I've just planted them? I always use, always use Start Grow. Guys, Start Grow promotes rooting, rooting and quick shoot growth. It's, it helps the plant get through that stressful period. Very importantly, it helps it getting through that stressful period of transplanting. So when you transplant seedlings into the garden, when you're planting seeds and they just started to germinate, when you're transplanting a plant, um, anything, we use this because it is brilliant. What it does, it nourishes the plant to produce amazing roots very fast and to get that first flush. It's got no N, P and K in it. Interesting that it's got all the other trace elements and a little bit of some special ingredient to make sure that we're getting good, good root growth. Okay, so now that we've shown you how to repot um, that little guy, we would give it a good watering. Um, either we can use one of these, but this would be more for if I'm just feeding it. Give it a good watering like we've shown you, but say you've got those and you want more. Guys, I want you to watch the video coming up now. We show you how to make more of these state secrets. Now unleashed. Look what happened while you were away. I cleaned the deck and got rid of all the mess. But guys, there's another form of propagating indoor plants that I'd love to just quickly show you. And that's simply just in water. Um, it's very, very popular, exceptionally popular with the youngsters because it is easy to do. It really is. Here's a little Hoya. Um, it's just been popped in some water. And look at all those beautiful leaves. All that you've got to do is clean out the water every few weeks because it does get a bit like greeny and you know, a bit slimy, but nevertheless. Um, and really, you can take a lot of plants and simply just pop them in water. Look how this root has grown. It's actually taken the shape. And it, it's lovely. Um, you will find it quite challenging when you're going to take plants from water straight into soil. You will find the plant will drop off. It's not going to look as great because those these roots that are in here are the water roots and they don't absorb the same nutrition, so it's going to take a little while for it to adjust. But look at them. They look great. I mean, even a little peperomia here. Look, 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 look. Oh, you know, 
look at me, mommy. I got a little leaf. Um, and, and it's really fun and easy to do. So, uh, you know what? There's always the best plants are always the, um, the stolen plants. Did I say that? Absolutely. Um, so when you're visiting somewhere um, and uh, you don't have this little Hoya, well, you can just like pretend that you're like sneezing or something and then and then you're like, oh, you got a bit of a Hoya here and then you can take it home and then you can just pop it in some water and then you can grow it. So uh, life is good and uh, you've got to make plans um, when you need the right plants. You know what I'm saying? Right, guys. Um, before we, we start rounding up, here are your jobs for the weekend. Um, spring is in the air. There's lots to do. So take a watch. Well, there we have it, guys. Um, remember, please, to get hold of your latest copies of our magazines. They're big, they're fat, they've got extra pages, and they're waiting for you. Um, we've got Grow to Eat, our new issue that's out. It's all about peas. It's about seaweed. It's about foraging. It's about okra. What is okra? Can I eat it? Yes, you can. And it's as cheap as chips. Um, there's some yummy recipes in here. And if you also want to check them out on YouTube, we've also got some food recipes on there. So please do go and indulge. But Grow to Eat is yummy. Um, our latest issue of The Garden and Detainee are also on shelves now and waiting for you. Remember that you can also get a digital subscription special. Check it out on our Facebook page. Also just pop onto The Gardener's website. And it's dirt cheap. I think it's 60 Rand for three months access to either the... Oh, it's 66. Clickety click 66. Look, I said 66 rant um, for three months access. Plus, you get access to the back issues for three months, guys. Come on. That's like 20 bucks per month. That's like car guard money. Um, please come and support us. We, we, we need you. Um, we really need you. So um, when you see these gorgeous magazines, um, please make sure that you take a little bit of us back home. Um, a big shout out to our sponsors today, to Gardena um, for their awesome planting mat and gorgeous little tools and to Effecto for the garden gun. Folks, thank you so, so much. Um, we will answer the rest of your questions a little bit later today. Thank you as always for joining me and giving me of your time. Um, enjoy the moment. Nurture it, hold it, grasp it and stay positive. Um, thank you once again. Take care of you and yours, and most importantly, as always, happy gardening. God bless you all. Gardening with Tanya was proudly brought to you by Gardena. Realize your gardening dreams. Effecto, target pesky garden pests. The Gardener and Detainee magazines. And TanyaFisser.com for all your gardening goodies and supplies. All plants kindly supplied by Blackwoods, the home of gardening. Calling all green-fingered gurus and plant killers alike. We got you covered every month with gardening inspiration, hands-on practical advice and fun projects to do. From the latest in plant fashion, growing your own, whether to prune or not to prune, from cover to cover, the Gardener and Detainee magazines have got your back. Get your copy now or subscribe online at thegardener.co.za.